I'm going to go on my screen. I'm going to start with Kara Lafollette. Kara has actually been with us only about four or five months, but she's come in and made a huge impact. She actually runs our whole multifamily business since we have multifamily properties in, call it a fourth of our states and markets that we're in. And so she is, she's here to run that and she's doing an incredible job. One of the things I love about her is that she's, she jumps right in and has a bias for action. And so I think you'll see that today and very knowledgeable, comes from a background, a long history of managing multifamily and worked for a big institutional multifamily manager. And so excited to have Kara here. Matt Patterson's also here. Matt also has a long history of property management experience. He has over a decade of SFR experience. And Matt is our COO here at Everness. And so he is a deep thinker. He's very detail-oriented. He, he measures twice and cuts once. And so he's really thoughtful. And I know you'll see that, which is the opposite of me. I, I just cut and then realized that I cut the wrong, the wrong length there. But that's why you always have people that help you with your weaknesses. And Matt certainly does that for me and huge part of the team. And Matt's been here since about January 1st-ish. And then last but not least is Gray Hall. Gray has been here for, is it eight years now, Gray? Only seven. Only seven. Only seven. Yeah. But he came to us as a little babe in diapers. Somebody left him on our doorstep over at 1701 Oxmoor Road. And we basically raised him in the business. Uh, he's like our Mowgli here where he, he we've taught oh, him everything yeah. he knows. He doesn't know how hard property management is because he doesn't have any other, he doesn't have any other experience, industry experience. The good news is if don't tell him that property management's hard or maybe he'll go do something else. But Gray actually runs our markets. So oversees our five regions today and is our VP of Op. Welcome everybody. Excited to have you on the show. Those, right. are, those are more, those are better than Spencer's there, actually. Much better, much better. Yeah. Mine was pretty weak. I wasn't prepared to talk about mine. We'll, we'll workshop it later for you. Yeah, I should ask ChatGPT. <laughs> All right, everybody. So I'm going to drop the first poll. Let me see here. First poll, just want to get a, just want to get a, an idea how many property managers work in your business right now. So there it is. There are your choices. And Matthew, to, to kick this thing off after we've done all this housekeeping and introductions, I thought that it would be good if like, we just step back. You and I got in real estate almost 20 years ago and started buying and selling houses. And then you started Evernest in 2008, so 15 years ago. And it was a lot different back then. So why don't you talk just briefly, maybe some of your biggest takeaways of what's changed over the past 15 years? Because I'm guessing that people are on this call are all across the board. Some have probably been in business as long or longer than you, and some may have just started a couple of years ago or a year ago. Yeah, I'd love to cover two things, like what has changed and then what has not changed. When I first got into this, first of all, for those of you who hadn't heard my story, I always swore I was never going to be a property manager and I swore I was never going to be a real estate agent. And today I'm a broker in five states and arguably one of the biggest property managers in the country. And when I first got started, I, I this was, if you think that it was very like a fractured industry now, it was very uh, fractured back when we were doing this. There was no big players uh, the only big players were on the institutional multifamily side. So that industry had already consolidated. And when I went to my first industry event, which was an ARPAN conference, and I think it was in 2010, I, I looked around the room and I realized there was no national player. And there was a friend of mine that I met there that was uh, a little older than me, but not too much older. And, and he worked with an organization that managed 5,000 doors. And I had this big dream, and we talked about this at Evernest, to manage 25,000 doors. What's allowed that to happen, though, like why was there not, why was there not a national player at the time? The gray stars of the world they don't, they never wanted to get into this because it was too hard. There was, you have a lot of owners, you have houses scattered all over the city. 
a lot of drive time, logistics, communication to everybody. It was just a really hard problem to solve. And what has changed is, and I can still remember people keeping rent in Excel and or paper ledgers. And what has changed is that technology is to the point now where it allows us to scale these organizations because technology makes things like communication a lot easier. Technology makes things like logistics and getting around a city a lot easier. Technology makes gives us visibility into what our day should be in workflows. And that's what's absolutely changed is the ability for technology to be applied to what we're doing here today. Now, what hasn't changed and what I think is probably going to be a core of what we talk about today, we certainly can talk about technology, is owners still want you to execute. They still want their property managed really well and, and us to execute. And the other thing is they really want communication. And so that has not changed. When I would get fired 15 years ago, they would say, you didn't execute or you didn't communicate. And today, when Everness gets fired, we get fired for the exact same reasons that either we didn't execute or we didn't communicate really well. Awesome. Why don't we get right in? You mentioned that. Why don't we start right there, Matthew? We can ask our guests what they're seeing, because I know that Matt, Gray, and Kara on the front lines of this. I would love to hear from you all, like Matthew's summary of communication and execution. Are you finding that true when you're hearing from owners, when you're talking with owners, as far as like challenges when they're upset, what they're upset about? What are you all hearing actually from owners? Kara, why don't you kick us off? Oh, sure. Hello, everyone. So Absolutely. Communication being the biggest marker, that is one of the things that just hasn't changed in the last several decades. We all want to be communicated to, especially when it's something as high value as our assets. So if we don't feel like the property management company is communicating with us, are they also going to be able to manage the nuances within our assets? Are they going to be communicating when something goes wrong? Are they going to communicate when something goes right? And it's that gray area in between that really has set a lot of owners on edge. So being an over communicator in this world is definitely going to set you up for success. Yeah, the thing I like about communication is it builds trust. And what I have found with owners is they never close the loop. If, if, if they don't know what's going on, it's like an open loop in their brain. And if you don't close the loop, then they don't fill it in with the best possible scenario. They fill it in with the worst possible scenario. And that may or may not be true. Generally, it's not true. But Gray, why don't you talk to me about building trust with clients, how important it is to, to build trust. Hey, why don't I do that? Yeah, super important to build trust. I think you start, and it starts with setting expectations on the sales side and then on the onboarding side. And I think people come into this wanting to believe. And it talks about like communication and execution. You can be really great at communicating, but if you keep telling them, hey, the rehab's not finished, or hey, we didn't get this done, that only goes so far. And so that's why you also got to be communicating. What I've seen is like high trust at the beginning, one mistake, forgiveness, two mistakes. And so the frequency and how close together the mistakes are really telling to if you can rebuild trust. Now, I think really great communication can overcome if you have executional issues. And we've seen that as we scale the business or you have a new PM in there, that if you are great at communicating, I think it can overcome some lack of execution. And it's interesting, like when I think about communication, it's not necessarily, there's a couple of different parts of it. It's how frequently you do, but it's also what you say in the context you give. And I've even been digging in because we get feedback from owners and they say, hey, the communication is terrible. And I'll look at the email log and we're responding within a very reasonable time within our SLAs but they want to be talked to on the phone or there's some other expectation that they have that we're not meeting. And so it's a really challenging problem to solve. If you're not looking at it, Hey, are we getting the owner, the information they want whenever they need it? And are we being proactive with it? And so we've talked a lot about at that team. It's really challenging as you bring people in, teaching them how to communicate in this SFR world. Cause I think it's just different than a lot of other industries. I'll just add, yeah, real quick, two things to that. One is if you think about the execution and you think about the communication, it's really the unforgivable com combination of not doing either of those things is, is what's going to wind you up getting, getting fired. The other thought that 
wanted to share is like in the in a world where we are getting our updates from Amazon and from online shopping and all of these things fed to us constantly. So the the world around us is communicating at a higher and higher level with our clients. And I think that they're even getting used to some of that. And they're seeing us as a service provider and wanting the same type of engagement from us and the same kind of updates and the same kind of proactivity. Got a notification yesterday that my water filters weren't going to show up on time from Amazon. Like that's what they're getting used to and what they're conditioned to. It's another, it's an opportunity and also a challenge for us to try and keep up with that heightened level of communication and expectation setting from, from all the other industries that, that aren't property management. I think that's a great point, Matt. So what's your advice, anybody, this is for anybody, what's your advice as we are, like, this is not going backwards, right? This is just going to increase. Like how do property managers, especially ones who are doing everything, right? They're out showing the property, they're leasing the property, um, they're out doing inspections. How do they handle this? And um, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, I'll take a stab at that. I think Gray made a really great point earlier around the expectation setting, just being very clear with, with your owners in terms of what they can expect over the course of working with you as their property manager. I think that's, if you don't set those expectations, if you're really just setting yourself up for failure. When I, it's funny, Matthew mentioned me being a deep thinker because I don't think of myself that way. But when I think about it, there's all these inflection points over the course of, of management where you can either build trust and continue in a positive direction, or you have the opportunity to erode trust and go the other direction. When I think about our clients and I think of, okay, how do we continue to build trust? It's knowing what are those inflection points? What are those hot button items? Do they have delinquency? Are they facing an eviction? Is their property being termed and turned and they're not seeing cash flow? And then putting our Amazon hat on or uh, another company that does a really good job just managing our expectations and keeping us updated. That's the lens that I think of it from. And I think we're, we're certainly not perfect at this today and have a long room to grow as a company, but if we can do that successfully, figure out those hot button items, figure out those inflection points and get in front of that communication. That's really the magic recipe from my perspective. Points, they know when you want to know that your filter is either going to be there or be delayed. And I think tech will be able to get there. Currently, it's not perfect because we operate in, at least us, so many different systems. There's been a lot of innovation in the SFR industry over the past 10 years where there's a great leasing solution. There's a great maintenance solution. There's not really one thing that does everything short of having a great technology system like Amazon that can be hard coded and can be automatically in digesting information and feeding it out. Have you mapped out your leasing process? When do you know the owner is going to answer questions? They're sitting there thinking, Has my property hit the market yet? Where's the link to the Zillow? And hey, did I get an application? So I think you can, and I've even done some of this recently where I've mapped out those processes. I'm looking at what are our safe templates? What are we doing? And are we teaching our team to be proactive when we know owners have questions? And so tech will get us there eventually, but you can map out some of this and visually see, hey, owners are going to be here and here really highly sensitive. Let's get them an email 24 hours before we know that they're going to ask that question. Yeah, I think those are great points. Let's zoom out. And we here at Evernest, we look at uh, a couple of different avatars. When we think of owners, when we think of clients, we're looking at uh, who we call Susie and Steve homeowner. This is the one house, one owner, the accidental landlord. And I'm guessing that all of you property managers who are on here now who know who that is. And then we also have what, who we call Mike and Mary, the investor, and they are actively building a rental portfolio. Then we also have institutions that we manage for, but just thinking, zooming out and thinking about these two different avatars, Kara, Matt, Gray, do these people expect different types of communication? Do we handle that differently? What are your thoughts around different avatars or different people desiring or needing different types of communication. You want to jump in, Kara? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think that some things are going to stand true no matter if you're Mike and Mary or you're a Susie and Steve. I think the need to be communicated with is going to be there irregardless. Whether you are operating a single home or you're operating on a larger scale, you still want to have those checkpoints and that data in front of you on a regular basis. One of the things that we have found in the multifamily realm to help get ahead of that is to, number one, ask the question, 
What do you want to know? We're going to give you this. What do you want in addition to that? And then we're going to build that into our reporting and we're going to have that on a fluid basis to be able to answer those questions for you. I know that everybody's probably dealt with difficult owners. And when I say difficult owners, it's not that they may be difficult in general, it's that they have a lot of questions and they need a lot of hand holding. And if you can prepare yourself in such a way where you already know the answers to these questions in advance of them, it becomes so much less burdensome to manage in the long run. The way uh, our president, uh, I think Graham has been on this webinar before, I'm, I'm assuming, but the way that he describes it, anticipate and communicate, I think that holds true for both sets of our customers. The one thing that I add to what Kara said is on the Susie and Steve, the ones that maybe this is their first rental, holding their hand a little bit more through the process and managing their expectations outside of just the interactions with the property manager but also just here's what you can expect and here's what you can, here's what's normal and here's what's not normal. Like really holding their hand and kind of being an education partner for them, I think goes a long way. And then similar to what Kara said on the Mike and Mary side, a lot of these owners want to know everything that's going on with their property every single week. So really figuring out what type of comprehensive update can we provide and just making it systematic. So you can even eliminate a lot of that communication by just getting aligned on what kind of deliverables do they want to consume. Yeah, Karen mentioned there's a baseline of communication that should happen, but there is a difference with more sophisticated, intentional investors. Kira deals with that a lot with our larger multifamily. A lot of times these are syndicators or these are like multi-million dollar assets. And there's a different level of expectation that you see in large multifamily. <clears throat> then there are the Mike and Mary, which they might own some duplexes, quadplexes, but it's a lot of single family portfolios. But again, they've either raised money or this is like multi-million dollar portfolio. And that takes different level of communication. And I think Pira said this one time at a meeting, but it's just communication is important, but context is everything. And one thing that we do for our larger Mike's and Mary's is there's a weekly report that goes out. She does this on multifamily owners as well. But getting back to, hey, what are the hot point questions? What is delinquent? Not just telling them, hey, there's delinquency and sending them a rent roll from Appfolio or your software, but all right, what action have you taken? What are the next steps? Are they on a payment plan? Are we going to have to evict? Maintenance work order comes in, not just letting them know, hey, this has come in. What are we doing about it? What are the next steps? Just anticipating every question on the leasing front. So we'll go through the main buckets there and trying to weekly provide them that information with the hope that it answers their questions and they don't have to reach out because y'all know this, when you get on the phone with an owner and they've got a bunch of questions, you might not have all the information at your fingertips. You've got to get back with them. So building a process like that is a good way to anticipate the questions the owner is going to have and be able to deliver that information to them. Yeah, yeah. Great. Oh, great. can I just add one thing, Spencer? Yep. Yeah, one of the things that I didn't mention here was the absolute need to communicate with the owners in a way that answers all the questions that they are trying to ask of you on a regular basis. So don't be so redundant in the answers that you are giving that you forget to answer the things that they actually want to know. If you are giving them the same set of information and they are continuing to follow up with you, you're not giving them the right set of information. So be willing to modify what it is that you're providing to them to be not to go beyond what the system's capabilities are, but to handle the nuances that are within each owner. And then the other piece that I would add to that is that you have to know what you are doing and you have to be able to communicate that. And I'll just tell a very quick story about when I first stepped in board with Evernest. I went into an owner meeting. I had never met this owner before. I knew almost nothing about their portfolio. And in that meeting was my leasing agent as well. And this leasing agent, in response to an owner question about the state of the building, decided to tell the owner that the elevator was dingy and, and dark and that the walls had damage on them and that there was trash on the floor. And so what did he tell that owner? He told that owner, I saw a problem and I didn't do anything about it. And yeah, our vacancy is high, but I don't know why. So it was me stepping in and going, hey, yeah, I see those things and we have a work order in on this. And we already knew about that light. That'll be changed out tomorrow. And so it's owning not just the information, but the outcome and being able to communicate that. Sorry, thank you. No, I think you nailed it. One of the things I always talk about is this tennis-like communication where we have a PM just trying to hit the ball back in the owner's court. 
And what I have found is if you can anticipate the next question or maybe the next two questions, and I always, I was always actually pretty good at this because I owned houses. So I would say, you know, here's the answer to your question, but then here are like two or three other things that I'm like anticipating you're going to ask next, because these are the questions I would ask. And as PMs, as they get better, they become less of this like tennis back and forth and they're able to, to basically leave it on, um, leave the ball with them because they're, they're anticipating those extra questions. Matt, I got a question for you. Somebody put it in the chat. Remember everybody, there is a Q&A section, so please put it in there, but we'll catch any that come in the chat as well. Uh, Matt, this is a good one for you. How can you train people on how to better communicate? My team generally thinks they are okay at it, but in reality, not so much. <laughs> Yeah, I'm um, happy to take a stab at that one also, um, but would also welcome Gray and Kara to jump in. When I think about training people, I think a lot of it has to, I think a lot of it comes down to what does good look like or what does great look like? Because I, I think uh, I'm seeing the, the question here from Dina, totally understand that somebody can think that they're communicating really well, and maybe that is good communication for them, but we are needing more, we are needing different, we are wanting to provide a differentiated owner experience. Um, but they may not just know what that looks like. So I think, hey, here's the email you sent. Here's what that email could have looked like and making it really tangible. After a couple, and it, I think it depends on the size of your organization, how scalable this is. If you've got a small team, I think this is easier. Bigger team, you have to think about what tools you're going to use. But Here's what, here's what you did. Here's what good looks like. Here's what great really looks like and helping them understand that difference. I think that that does presuppose that your people are open to feedback. So I think having the right people in the right seats and making sure that those people understand that you're invested in them. You want to help them be the best property manager. They can be that their success is not just solely dependent on them, but that you're a partner in that. I think that, like I said, presupposes the feedback and that the, the coaching but definitely not an easy problem to solve. And it's like a, a culture of feedback, but also a culture of continuous training. So we're trying to build this into our managers because small organization, you have two PMs, like you as the owner, you may own properties, what great looks like. You're in the same office and you can communicate that as your business scales, it becomes more challenging. And so are you building that into the manager where part of their job is coaching and showing this is what good is and this is what great is. And so are you building systems in where they're reminded about that? Because it's easy for somebody to get 60 days in and then you stop up training and stop leveling up and stop developing. The other thing that we do is there's like the fundamentals of communication. So there's a lot of like content out there about generally, hey, what are great ways to communicate? And I think those are good building blocks. But I think a lot of the benefit comes from like real life examples. And so similar to what Matt said, we're putting on training for our property managers and showing like, this is what bad looks like. And this would have been great. These are the second and third order consequences of communicating in this way. And so I think that's like harder for newer people. But the more that you get this, Matthew was able to anticipate, but he also knew if he said this, there's three other questions and it will make them think this. And so context is really important. And so it just takes time, but I think you can short circuit that by continuously showing them, hey, this is what great looks like. Be read between teaching them to read between the lines. If you say this is what the owner is going to think, and it just takes a lot of time, a lot of, and it's not just like one way content, it's managers interacting and then broadly putting that on for your larger team. Great. One, one slightly more just technical piece on, on the communicating. I'm assuming a lot of the communication y'all are doing is written communication, email and text and things like that. Um, prior life spun up a, a team that was strictly owner facing. That means all they were doing was communicating with owners all day, every day. We had a required reading book. It was on writing well, which I still highly recommend. So go get that book and, and give it to your property managers. But a lot of what they talked about in that book was focusing on brevity and how brevity is highly underrated. And, and when you think about it, from the owner's perspective, getting right down to the point, doing it in a way that is clear, concise, and very actionable from there, I think is a really important piece. That's a good book for if you're uh, looking for something to give your folks to, to write a little bit better. Yeah, I think I, I was just going to say one thing. I noticed when we were smaller, like Gray was talking about, 
we were all in the office. And so we, we were constantly seeing how each other wrote, but as we started to grow, I think the um, temptation in, during that period was like, how can we just set responses and forget about it? So we can just click these one answer response, like these phrases. And so we, we use Help Scout. And so we set up a bunch of automated responses and then what we started doing was like anybody could create those automated responses. And so all of a sudden you had hundreds and hundreds of responses that people could just go in and click. And there really wasn't a lot of, in my opinion, there wasn't a lot of quality control. And so as you grow, that becomes the challenge. The challenge is really quality control, understanding what's being said. Because when I, a couple of years ago, I went into Help Scout and started looking at some of the responses. I was like, wow, I hope people aren't using this. And we need to do a better job, but that's just kind of part of it. <laughs> I would have a, I have a question for Gray because he's dealt with a lot of one house, one owners, and institutional clients, or what we would call Mike and Mary. How does communication in your mind differ between those two avatars? If I have the accidental landlord versus the intentional, and let's just think about it from a retail investor standpoint. I hit on some of it, but <laughs> institutional investor, Mike and Mary, multi property owner. They care about the numbers. They care about performance. They care about how their portfolio is performing, the timing of everything. With some accidental landlords, they care about really nervous about the quality of the tenant. So on the leasing front, there's a lot of questions about that. There seems to be more like worry from the one house, one owner, because they've got to come out and pay the mortgage out of pocket if it's vacant or on the repair side. What's interesting is when owners used to live in that house. There's just an emotional connection. Their kids grew up there. They've got these memories. And a lot of times we'll do the right thing. They want to invest in, and spend money on that. And so a little bit different types of conversations. It's you know more detailed on like the numbers and performance for the larger institutional investors, but there's still an expectation that you really know the house because they really know the house on the one house, one owner and crafting it a little bit different way. I think brevity on the institutional investor side, but I think I'm saying from the one house, one owner, they, they care and hone in on different things than the institutional investor does where they care about, Hey, is the tenant really happy? Are they enjoying the home? The quality of the maintenance, it might be like we have recommended and required. They're more likely to do the required to keep up the quality of that home and less about the financial return. And does this rehab make sense? And does it generate more NOI? Does that answer the question? Make sense? Hey, you, you said it backwards, but more likely to do the recommended and the required. But yes. Yeah, thank you. Both. Yeah. So Kara, I'm going to come to you and ask you a question about empathy, but I'm going to tell a story first and like empathy and communication. And one time, this was probably about four or five years ago, I, I was so frustrated because I felt like our PMs lacked empathy when they would go to our owners and say, hey, bad news, you've got a $2,500 air conditioning bill. And so I was trying to think like, how can I make them feel? Because it was easy for me because I had felt the pain of a, a, an air conditioning bill because it came out of my pocket. And so it was really easy for me to call up and have empathy for them because I had experienced that. And so I was trying to figure out like, how can I basically make them feel that same pain. Like you think you have this money in your pocket and then all of a sudden you don't. And so I came up with this genius idea on a Friday to just tell everybody that everybody, their paychecks were $500 short. And I've tried it out on Spencer and he started crying. And so I realized that was probably a bad idea. I, I don't remember who talked me out of it, but it's like the same idea of, hey, you thought you were going to get paid X but really you're getting paid X minus $500. Now, how does that make you feel? And that's the feeling I wanted. Now, I wasn't really going to do that, but I wanted the feeling of the shock of that $500. And so here, to the point, like empathy is really important when you're communicating with owners. And so I'd just love to hear you talk about when I say empathy when in this business, what does that, what, what, what does that bring to mind for you? Yeah, sure. So several thoughts on this. First off, if we're talking about the team that we're putting in place to have these conversations, you need to build that in on the front end. You don't want to hire somebody who acknowledges that they are not an empathetic person and ask them to be empathetic. And this is a big part of the Evernest model, right? Not just getting the right people on the bus, 
but getting the people in the right seats on the bus, that's huge. So you need to have the underlying basis if you're going to be the person making those lines of communication. And then secondarily from there, it's business or no business, profit, no profit. At the end of the day, everyone is still a person. And so you want to treat them with the same level of respect you would expect back for yourself. I often think and talk through with my team, if this were me, how would I want to hear this? And, and Matt too, also, when I came on board at Evernest, I remember being just absolutely astounded by his willingness to acknowledge where we had made a mistake and that we owed it to the owners to do right by them. And I think that comes from a really high level in your development. So whether you are a single person managing one other person who is communicating with your owners, it's your job to build that into your team and make sure you've got the right person facing the customers that you want. And that empathy is a piece of that, but also to, to balance the fact that empathy can only go so far. You can feel bad and you can communicate your feel bad while also not giving away the farm. So empathy does not come hand in hand with concession. For example, empathy can stand on its own and still go alongside delivering difficult information. I don't know that there's a perfect recipe to this, but I would say that putting the right person in the right seat definitely is a start. You're muted. So to have, so to have empathy, it's important to hire empathetic people. You, and you can tell by Matthew trying to do that to his employees, he didn't have empathy for them. <laughs> he just was like, he didn't care. That's why I, I think it, so much. It's also important to remember when you're a PM and you're just work orders, you might have three sewer backups, four HVACs, 10 water heaters all going on. And that's like your day. But this one house, one owner, that's the one time a year where they have a $5,000 expense coming out. And I've seen it. It's easy to get lost in that because property management is a hard business. Somebody asked a question and said, yeah, it's a gritty business and you have to have that. But I think I've seen that challenge where you just get so used to all of these issues going on. You forget that's the one time a year that happens to them. And that's like real money. They've got to come out of pocket that they weren't expecting. So make sure the team's not losing sight of that in the midst of all the chaos of property management. And if you short your team $500, call me up and tell me how it goes. <laughs> it's still on the table. David in the chat said he, he had the temptation to do that too. David and I think a lot alike. I like David already. <laughs> All right, let's get to some questions in the, in the Q&A section. Freddie would like to know, and this was where the gritty thing came from. Thank you for putting on this for all of us gritty property managers. That's gritty is a great adjective. I think there's a lot of other adjectives that people use to describe us property managers. What is the best platform for dealing with communications between tenants and managers? Matt, why don't you take that? Yeah, I'll take a stab at that one. So I've worked in I've worked in Zendesk and had teams work out of Zendesk. I've worked at organizations where everything was homegrown, totally built from scratch, CRM, all communication was on our own technology. And then I've worked in organizations where you've got a hybrid of some of the communication happens in your own platform. Some of it happens in third-party platforms. So in terms of the best, I don't know that I can say there is a single best. I think there are advantages to all three of the situations that I mentioned. I think consistency of use and having good SOPs and having clear expectations with your team is probably the most important because even if you have a great, if you've got, if you've built your own platform that is texting and community emails and you have really good visibility, but really at the end of the day, you need to pick up the phone and have a hard conversation. The fact that it's just a written communication only is not going to solve for that client's, that customer satisfaction. I'd say it's Yes, it does. We need a good platform to communicate with our, I'm um, sorry, this is tenants and managers. Sorry, I was thinking more on the owner side here. Gosh, and I've, I've got less to add on the tenant side. I think visibility and transparency into that communication across your organization is probably the, the primary uh, thing that I would say is, is most important. But again, clarifying how that technology should be used, when to pick up the phone, making sure that the people are communicating within their your team members are communicating within certain SLAs. We respond in 24 hours. We respond in eight hours or four hours or whatever the case may be. So uh, don't have a perfect answer for you. What would you all add to that? Here, what would you, oh, go ahead, Greg. Just seeing a shift from email to texting for tenants. So having a platform that has texting. The other thing is like a shared inbox. So Matt mentioned Zendesk. There's also Help Scout. Front is another one. 
there's a lot of benefits to having that component of it from a quality control standpoint. If somebody's out on vacation or if a, you know, a, per, a property manager leaves and somebody else comes in, having that shared inbox is game changing opposed to people working out of their Gmails. It's just really hard to audit the business, to share a workload between those. So I think texting, I've seen a lot of tenants like that. And if you could have texting and email in the same system, that is hugely beneficial because we've seen the challenges going from a VOIP phone system and another platform for texting and another for email. If I'm trying to research an issue, you got to go into three places. And so that does create challenges. So there are point in solutions that have all of those built into them. And Zendesk offers all of those. Those are the, the two things that I've seen work really well. Yep, I can add in on that one. So this is a, an area where I feel like I've affected a lot of change in my career path, I guess you could say, is in the tenant communication front. What I have found to be the most successful is utilizing these systems, absolutely. These will make your life easier. But the very, very basis of this comes down to being willing to have conversations with people outside of just notice delivery. I don't know if anybody has ever had to deliver difficult information to a tenant, maybe a lease violation, or maybe an increase increase on a renewal. It is so much easier to get that through when you can have a conversation with that person and relate to them person to person. So while there is an enormous amount of things that can be automated in this industry and communication can be to some degree, I don't think that you can overstate the importance of just picking up the phone and making that call and making that connection. Resident training is what I call that. And resident training starts the day that you that someone applies. You communicate to them, hey, if you you need to get a hold of me, the very best way that you can do that is here. And if I don't respond to you within the next 24 hours, I will still get back to you. And then hold yourself and your team accountable to those metrics so that you are delivering on the promise that you've given. And don't overpromise. Don't tell everybody you'll get back to them in 12 hours if you can't get back to them in 12 hours. Be realistic in your approach and be willing to adjust based on your client base. Awesome, Kara. You uh, actually started answering and may have been given your answer for the, the next question. Would email be the best type of communication or would a phone call be best? You want to take that, Kara? I sure will. Anybody who has gone through fair housing law knows the consistency. So for your own sake, put it in writing. But also, if you're going to deliver that in writing and the resident's relationship with you matters or it matters to your owner, pick up the phone and make the call. So lease violation notices, namely, are a big one where this happens. Delinquency notices. How many of you get delinquent rent paid just by delivering a notice? And how many of you have to go the additional mile and make a phone call to get somebody to respond to you? Don't think that any single avenue of communication is going to get you where you need to be. You need to have some flexibility, especially in the world that we're operating in. But also to make sure you're putting the information in writing, because if it ever comes back to it, you want to have something to reference to say, no, this is what I said, this is what I meant, and this is how I communicated it. Awesome. Thanks, Kara. Matt? I was just going to add one thing to that. I, especially in today's day and age, like it's so tempting to think that communication, that emails and texts and automation are just going to solve all of these problems. But I, I would argue, I have a suspicion, I know this is a shared suspicion, but picking up the phone, despite it being... I don't know, old fashioned in some ways, I think that in many situations, it will save you more time over the long run just to have that conversation. I've seen so many email threads just go back and forth endlessly that could have just been solved by picking up the phone and having a five minute conversation. We, I think, just underestimate the power of doing that on the front end and overestimate, I'm sorry, underestimate some of the back and forth that happens via email and texts. I just posted this in the chat channel, but we have a principal here and we stole it from another property manager because he, he used to always say this, but it's make your worst call your first call. And so we talk about that once a month around here to pick a phone and knock out that hardest call. One of the things that we generally find is that those calls go off fairly well. What we were actually scared of is not, in reality, it doesn't happen. And one of the things I've seen is if you'll get that done with first part of your day, you have the rest of the day to enjoy it, being done with it. You feel a sense of accomplishment and it gives you some momentum versus putting it off, which is what most of us do, myself included, and doing it the last thing of the day. And then you've stressed it all day and you could have been done with it. 
make sure you're making your first your worst call your first call. All right. Spencer, will you surface the we ran a poll and how many people and we never yeah. showed everybody yeah. that. Answer. Yeah, I did I did share well, it must not have come up, but yeah. So the poll results, the and the question was how many property managers work in your company? And 32% said one, 40% said between two and four property managers, 26% said between five and nine property managers. And then just one one group here that has 10 plus property managers in their company. That's great. Yeah. So that was the poll. And let me drop this one in as well. Love to see y'all's your answers here. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. We got a question here uh, that Ben Turner put in the chat that I want to revisit or, or come back to because it was he posted a couple of minutes ago. Aside from communication and the relationship with the owners, I'd love to know what you do regarding the relationship with the resident that fosters a resident that stays longer and takes better care of your investors' doors. I, I think this is a great question because we always talk about a, re, a, a happy resident renews the renewing resident doesn't doesn't turn you have less churn so gray how do you just how would you answer this question the number one reason that tenants leave or cited as reasons is speed of maintenance and that's a big one to focus on which can be challenging when we are making all of the decisions and we're advising the owner but really focusing on what is your process of managing work orders? What's your process of communicating to the work or, uh, to the tenants during that process? So do you have good vendors that are responsive, that are getting out there uh, really quickly? And are you communicating about that? The challenging part of that is tenant wants something done. Owner doesn't want to pay for it. It's not required and be able to communicate that. Sometimes it's out of our control, but that's the biggest reason that tenants leave. And so that's why we've got a big focus on the maintenance area. And one of the benefits, if, depending on your scale, if you can have your own W-2 maintenance technicians, we control their schedule. If it's an emergency, we can get them out there. And they're also representing Evernest. So that's one big area that I've seen that we focus on and that directly ties to whether or not a tenant is going to stay. Good. Awesome. Our next question here, how to best negotiate new rent or lease renewal between owner and resident, owner expectation and resident expectation in tough markets like Ohio? Great question. Who wants that one? I'll take it. That's a fun one. Yeah. So my question back to you is, do you know your market? Very often. We will get the impression that it's not leasing because we're priced too high. It's not leasing because we the property across the street is $200 less. When in reality, it's that we just don't understand what's happening in our market to be able to make good decisions with that. So when you are going to an owner or you are going to a resident with this information, knowing that will help you make the best decision moving forward. We have weekly checkpoints where we're reviewing our pricing. If a unit gets to a certain stage and it's still on the market, yeah, sometimes it does need a price drop, but sometimes it needs us to put extra emphasis on leasing that unit to get that price because the market can sustain that price. So don't always go to price dropping as though that is the end all be all to leasing a unit. Although sometimes it can be the quickest way to get a unit leased, that's not always the case. For instance, I work uh, predominantly in the Richmond market right now. And in Richmond, rents are pretty high, but also everybody in every property management company I see is giving away a month of free rent. Now I could look back at our portfolio and I could say, we should be giving away a month of free rent, but why am I gonna do that on a 90% occupied property that only needs one lease to get it up to 100%? I know that property is priced accordingly to the market and that I don't have to give that away. So I'd say know your market and know what your product is worth and do regular check-ins. In the multifamily world, if anybody has worked in the multifamily world, market surveys are your driving force. You are forced every month, if not every week, to call your competitors and find out what their rates are. We also have resources through organizations like apartments.com that can provide that information to 
to you free of service. So utilize those and know your market before you make pricing choices. On the, just on like lease renewals, you get two competing interests. Like we've got an obligation to bring the unit up to rent or at market. And the competing interest is the game you're playing of the negotiation is if the tenant doesn't agree with that and they move out, the owner is risking eviction or not eviction, sorry. The owner is risking vacancy. So the most helpful tips are like, are you providing comps and looking at what the market is? Don't fall into the trap of just a percentage renewal because rent rates have moved a lot over the past you know, three years. And so, hey, are you providing those to the owner? Are you advising them and educating them? This is where the market is. And if the tenant is pushing back on that, it becomes a negotiation of, hey, at what price is the tenant willing to stay? And at what price is the owner okay not to have vacancy? I think some owners get stuck on getting a certain rent number, a certain increase, and they forget the cost of vacancy, the cost of a turn, the cost of a leasing fee, and the cost of not receiving rent. And so it's definitely challenging. Vacancy is probably one of the most expensive things. And so opting to the number that it will keep the tenant in. So those would be tips, just sharing comps, really knowing the market. Kara said, and then being a middle party to find the underground with the owner's best interest of the most possible rent with the least possible vacancy. I did see a comment here that I think is really helpful to everybody and maybe even sparks a question. Big problem for me is owners who got used to big rent increases over the last couple of years and don't understand the market has shifted and we're not getting those same increases now, even after sending comp. That was more of a comment, but like, how would y'all address that? Yeah, so I just, I'm prepared and going to these conversations and I'm willing to stand firm on that, that if you want me to push this rate, it's going to mean you're going to lose this money in vacancy because the market doesn't support what you're trying to do. So you can lose the money either way. You can come down in the rents and you can get somebody in Occupied now and that's guaranteed rent for the next year, or you can lose the rents in vacancy because it's going to sit there longer trying to find that one tenant who's going to lease it at the rate that they're looking for. Not every conversation is going to be an easy conversation and you're not always going to be able to placate your owners. But if you can be honest and then stand behind your data, it's going to take you really far. At least they know that you'll be willing to have an honest conversation with them about it and not just promise them the moon and shoot for the stars. All right, let's talk next question. Aside from traditional credit criteria that is required to find high caliber tenants, are there other ways to add additional insights on who we lease our properties to? This feels like a dangerous question. Who wants to take it? <laughs> Who wants to go on the record? Okay, I'll do it. I'll, I, I do, because part of my history too is in fair housing regulation and fair housing law. So I'm a certified fair housing instructor with NAMA, the National Affordable Affordable Housing Management Association. And to go through those courses, there are things that you have to understand. Um, number one is that not all discrimination is illegal. So you can say, I don't want to rent to people with blue shirts, and that's legal. You can say, I don't want to rent to people who were over seven foot, and that's legal. Now, do you think it's going to fly? That's a whole other thing. So make sure that anything that you're doing is adhering to fair housing laws and make sure that you're not just looking at the national fair housing laws, but your local municipality or even state level fair, fair housing laws first. So that should be your benchmark. And then from there, determine what it is you're trying to do. If you are trying to fill your complex or your properties with doctors and lawyers, are you advertising to those places? One of the biggest mistakes early on in marketing for multifamily that I experienced was that I went to the wrong places to get residents. If I'm at a class A high rise community, I don't want to go put flyers in the laundromat. Am I going to attract the tenants from the laundromat? that are going to be able to rent at this property. And then one of the other lessons that I learned is that if my rents are $1,700 and my qualifications are that a tenant has to make three times that rent, am I marketing to people in that salary range? So who you're targeting to can absolutely be something that has levels of discrimination in it. It's just a matter of, is that discrimination legal or illegal? And not all discrimination is illegal. So just know. That's great, Kara. Thank you. Go ahead, Spencer. I, I dropped the questions on accident. Okay, yeah. David asked this question. What do you define as a PM, a property manager, considering some of us here have started using ultimately admins and office managers to do a lot of traditionally property manager tasks? So what do you consider, Gray, what do you consider a property manager? When you have people now using 
uh, admins and office managers to do typical PM work? Yeah, it's a good question. I think it's become more blended. I think property management is an industry and a lot of times from the outside, everybody can be a property manager. And then as you either start to hire other people, I, I don't know if there's like a, a clear kind of lane, the way that we define it as it's the owner's primary contact and they're overseeing like the life cycle of the property. And so I think there's central teams and there's additional people that help specifically with leasing, with maintenance, with discussing residents. But at the end of the day, the way that we've structured it is who's the primary contact for the owner and that is looking out for the owner's best interest and is overseeing the life cycle of the property, overseeing maintenance, leasing, et cetera. The lines can definitely be blurred, but a lot of times we can tie that to the communication and the relationship with the- Gray, do you think another way to say that, Gray, is it like if the diversity of the responsibilities, if it's a really diverse subset, set of responsibilities, typically think of them as a property manager. If they're specializing in one thing, typically don't think of them as a property manager. Yeah, yeah. And then is it on the other side? Because there's there's two people managing a diverse set on the maintenance, leasing, et cetera. I would probably still refer to who's managing and looking out for the owner. But yeah, the property manager is a very wide, they manage a lot, the life cycle of the property. It's you know, the entire kind of cycle from renewal and leasing and vacancy and maintenance, et cetera. So, yeah. Chris actually had a question he just sent us in the chat channel and Kara and I are trying to answer it, but the Zoom's not working for us. But I think everybody might want to know the answer to this question. Chris asked, can you publicly display you do not accept Section 8? And Kara, Absolutely. you were going to answer that. Yeah, the answer is that it depends on what state you live in. So each state is specific on whether or not they allow or I'm sorry, require you to accept Section 8. And when they're setting that benchmark, it's important to know what that looks like and what that means. So in Virginia, for example, if you are an owner that has more than four doors, you are required by the state legislature to accept Section 8. How do you get around this? You don't necessarily want to have a lot of Section 8 tenants. There's a lot of rigmarole that comes with that. First off, I would ask yourself two questions. Do I need Section 8? Do I want Section 8? And then how you proceed definitely depends on the answer to that question. If you need Section 8 because your facilities are high in vacancy and the rents support that, and that's the environment that you're going to be leasing in, then you want to pursue Section 8 tenants. You want to advertise to the Section 8 department. I, I have found that actually Section 8 will fill your units for you. You have to do very little marketing if you are in that avenue. But more often than not, I'm talking to people who don't want to accept Section 8. So how do you get around laws like this? While you may not be able to publicly display that you don't accept Section 8, if your rental criteria supports someone who is not on that program, then you'll be able to get by without that. For example, one of our rental criteria is that all of our tenants have to make three times the rent. Most often, someone on the Section 8 program's income is not going to meet that requirement. Therefore, while we do legally accept Section 8, the tenant still does not meet the criteria that they have to meet in order for them to rent from us. And income, by the way, is state by state regulated as well on that. And some of them say you can't consider rent or you can't consider income as a reason to deny someone. You have to consider other things. So is your credit criteria support that? Does your criminal criteria support that? Does your rental history criteria support that? And really just take a hard look at what that is and whether or not you need or want those tenants and what you can do, um, still abiding by the law to get the people in your facility that you want. Awesome. Thanks, Kara. Let's hit this follow-up question here, Matthew, because we had talked about uh, life cycles. We had somebody say, to follow up, what challenges do you see if a director is overseeing the life cycle and then departments do each piece versus maintenance versus leasing? What, what challenges do you see there? I don't know if I understand the questions, Spence. Do you want to re reread it? I can reread it. What challenges do you see if a director is overseeing life cycle and then departments do each piece? Yeah. Um, and feel free to either clarify in the chat or ask another question. But I think the way I understand it, somebody's overseeing, but no one person is the same person is not posting it for rent, talking to the tenants, handling the maintenance work orders. The challenge that you create is there's bottlenecks and there's silos and there's missed context. 
And as you scale, you do want people who are really focused at leasing, focusing on leasing and people who are know your vendors, they know issues, they know how to troubleshoot and triage to cut down on the owner's maintenance costs. The cost of that is you play a game of telephone where it starts over here by the time the information gets to the last apartment, it's either missing contacts or it's slightly different. We have definitely seen that. And so that is a challenge when each kind of point. So you've got to have really good handoff. You've got to have really good note taking. So are you using a system where somebody can reference and see timestamps and see the notes? And are the department heads, is there good communication between the department heads who's overseeing each of those, the leasing and the maintenance, et cetera? So there's no perfect answer because one person doing everything in the life cycle doesn't really scale. It's hard to replicate that person. They've got a lot of knowledge in their head. But the trade-off is you have somebody handling each of the different stages of the life cycle, and you've got to solve for the communication there. And so those are just challenges that we've seen as we scaled the business and every new stage has its own sets of challenges. So I hope, hope I answered that. that. That was the right way to interpret that. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to share the results of the poll. When I asked your biggest struggle as a property manager, can you all see, can you see what I'm, I guess you can't, can you? How about I do this? How about I share my screen? One second. I'll share what people said was their biggest struggle. I'll ask a question while he's doing that. So you've got everything. You've got hiring the right person, too many t touches per ticket. So labor efficiency, getting an owner to respond fast, consistency, following process, squatters losing doors to uh, sales to institutionals, buyers currently too many vacancies. Uh, there we go. Systems processes, screening tenants quickly and accurately, staffing, maintenance, turnovers, trying to keep everyone happy, uh, employee turnover, getting everything done, finding people to work, maintenance issues, holding vendors accountable, dealing with NYC compliance, making sure owners are being educated properly and maintenance, pricing and owners not understanding the prices going up. So a lot of maintenance in there. Let's talk about it. I'd be interested in the chat channel or maybe ask a Q&A in the Q&A channel. What, are, what about maintenance? We did a webinar about maintenance, and then we also have a podcast that we did about maintenance. We'd love to know what questions those are. Let me ask another question out of the Q&A. The biggest challenge is tenants not paying rent and leaving property with unpaid balance or sometime through eviction and with an unpaid balance and damaged property. Is there any way we can report them and they have this on their credit history? Every other property manager should know them. Gray, why don't you take it? Um, can you report? So balance, if they owe a balance or if there were damages above the security deposit, yes, that, can, that will be on the tenant's credit report. And it depends on what stage the eviction was in, if that would or would not be filed and on their records. Yes, but there's no, that'd be great if there was a property management internal where you could be able to see references from other landlords. I don't think that exists, but I do know credit balances will show up as a landlord debt. And so when you're screening them, that will show up. And then depending on the state, the local county, and at what stage the eviction actually got to, that will also show up on whenever you pull their credit. So I hope that answers it. Todd also says, if you use RBP by second nature, you can ask them to turn on negative reports to the credit bureaus as well. So they, what he's saying is they use positive reporting, which is like the carrot, right? You're paying your rent consistently on time and they're able to build credit and improve their credit score by doing that. But you can also turn on the negative side of that. Whereas if they are not on time, then, then it's reporting that as well. Let's see, Section 8 in Illinois is taking two and a half months from approval to move in. Can you continue showings and cancel Section 8 move in to find an applicant that is able to move in faster? I don't know if, Carrie, you're going to jump in and answer this question. I used to do this here in Birmingham, and they got really mad at me. And I told them, I said, my, my clients can't wait two months for you to figure out how to get somebody out here to inspect the property. And what they said is, all right, at least give us a month. And so we settled on 
if it got to 30 days and they had not inspected the property, then we would start showing it and try to rent it again. But Kara, was what I was doing illegal? Not necessarily. It's a matter of whether or not you applied that consistently. Yep. And I would encourage anyone, if you have a rental criteria that does not support that policy, then you should add that in there. So if you don't, for example, have in your policy that um, you have to move in within 30 days of application, maybe that's verbiage that you add so that you can stand behind that as a consistent application and get around that process. But also to know that a lot of these nuances exist within each one of your municipalities. Some judges are more lean than others, and only you are going to know in those interactions what that looks like. If you don't have good legal counsel there that represents you, I would encourage you to spend a few hundred dollars and talk to somebody who's a big landlord tenant attorney there and just get their advice. It's worth the few hundred bucks to know how to make the best decision here. Yeah, that's one of the interesting things I found, Kara, is that attorneys, inter like the law is the law, but I was said attorneys, but judges interpret it differently in different like different places. And so make sure I, my attorney used to always say, oh, good, this is judge so-and-so or, oh, great, this is judge so-and-so. We would want to be really careful with this one or we can push it on this one. Good stuff. Gray, were you about to say something? Somebody? Okay. Um, all right. I asked a question about maintenance and Carla was kind enough to answer uh, by giving us a question. My challenge with maintenance has been meeting the resident's expectation when it comes to speed of repair and holding vendors accountable to complete the repair within the deadline set. Matt, how can Carla make sure that she's getting uh, these maintenance techs out there quickly? They're getting the work done, holding them accountable to doing that, and then doing it, getting it completed in, in a timely manner. Yeah, it's it's definitely a hard problem to solve, Carla. And what I'd say is that's where if you've got the opportunity to explore having your own text, this is where um, a lot of the value is added and created um, because you do get to control that um, piece of the resident experience. But vendor management has been and I think always will be a challenge. It's its own body of work. At the end of the day, I think it just comes down to, again, setting a lot of really clear expectations and then being willing to, to fire a vendor and move on. I don't know that there's really any silver bullet here that lets this alleviates this problem across the board. I think the closest solution that we've found is having our own internal techs. Short of that, talking to people, finding the right, just continually trying to find new vendors and raise the bar with the vendors you have. That would be my, that'd be my best advice. What would you guys add to that? The hard problem. Hard problem. The hard problem. And yeah, it comes down to there are vendor relationships, but you constantly got to either be building those relationships or finding other vendors who have a higher level expectation. The bigger your company is, the more work you can send a vendor and the more likely that they would be able to go out there on a Friday afternoon for you or finding those vendors that, that may be able to do that. Our speed of repair is faster with internal tax because we control, there's a lot of you know, reasons not to do internal tax, but this is one way that's helped solve. And the other challenge is, as I've seen more tenants come out of like multifamily with on-site management and maintenance, a lot different expectation and timing on single family because you don't have somebody out there that already has the part for your toilet because there's 50 of the same toilet in there. So I've just seen that challenge as we, when multifamily tenants move into single family, goes back to setting expectations. Earlier, what we talked about, there are touch points that we know a tenant's going to want communication and are you delivering those? So solve it from the vendor side and then the communication side that we talked about earlier. Chris has a question. I, I find it difficult to track and keep a low tenant turn cost, TTTC, when the owners delay approving bids. Would love to have a time limit on them to approve or at least have an action plan on the next step. How do you think that would go over implementing something into the management agreement if they don't approve or make a payment plan within a set day limit? We've actually just talked about this, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah, we haven't we haven't rolled this out, but we we've, we've had this idea. So we we can let you know. But the the premise is wait, no, you do it first, Chris, and then let us yes. know. Yes, 
if it, if an owner gets a bid and then they sit on it, tenant moves out, you you give them a bid to turn the property. What's the owner's sense of urgency? That there naturally should be some there, but how can you sell benefits to the owner? Hey, I've got a crew that can start on Monday. So are you selling the value of it? We haven't put a time frame on it. There's a couple ideas, a couple pilots that we're going to run, which is, hey, if, it, if we don't get an answer by this day, the bid is no longer good. There is reality in that after... Yeah, a couple of days, the the house can materially change. So I think there's some reality in that. But do you think it's a good idea? Don't fully know how that would play out. But how are you selling the value? Are you creating a sense of urgency? And then are you moving the property to a different status? And so maybe creating some friction for the owner to start that work again. So don't know. Let, let us know how it goes whenever you roll it out. And I know we're talking about turns here, but if we have a big ticket item that we still need to get approval from the owner for. In a prior life, we really successfully ran a pilot and then implemented a process where we would say, hey, owner, here's what's going on. Here's our recommendation. Unless we hear from you in 48 hours or two business days, I can't remember what the exact time frame was, we're going to proceed as follows. And we would clarify that. And that actually worked out really well. Gave owners enough time to respond, but it also gave us the uh, like permission to just action when we needed to action. So uh, didn't do that on the turn side, but definitely works on even on big ticket repair and maintenance items. Just tagging along with that, do you have any suggestions when it comes to setting expectations with our residents and it, when it comes to maintenance, setting expectations around maintenance, Kara? Yep. So that comes down to your tenant training. Are you communicating to the residents what that timeline should look like? And are you communicating to them when you're having a hold? So very often where I see tenant agitation is not in placing a work order, not in the work order completion. It's that gap of time in between. So do they know that it may take you seven days to get out there if it's not an emergency work order? Do they know that you respond to emergency work orders within 24 hours? And if that's the case, do they know what an emergency work order even is? So if you can take the time to set those expectations with your tenants, then you can hold them accountable to those expectations. And I think that really solves a lot of that. There's another question that's uh, along the lines of maintenance. How do you communicate and educate owners for the pricing raises in the maintenance items? Some owners think that maintenance items are too expensive comparing it with other years. Obviously, inflation has been hitting everyone hard, but this also affects maintenance repairs. Like we, we've we dealt with communicating high maintenance prices to owners for the past 10 years. <laughs> Gray or Matt, any, any thoughts here? Yeah, it's again, it's a hard, it's a great question, hard problem to solve. Would encourage others to jump in, but it, it's a... Where my mind goes is we we know it doesn't, it's not that hard to look around and see the prices are going up. So my mind always goes to how can we be data driven about this thing that we're trying to communicate? It may not be easy to say, hey, plumbing, this plumbing item was $200 last year and now it's $350. The data just may not be there for something like that. Although there are some good third party price books, for example, prior life, we used a price book a lot to set expectations with owners around Hey, how much, how much is this item going to cost? Are we replacing a garbage disposal? If, if so, it's X, hot water heaters, Y. So a resource like that could be helpful, but this is one of those challenges that I don't have a good answer for. So Gray, what, and Kara and, and Matthew, I'm sure you guys have something it's, to add. It's that. easier now with the past two years, we've heard the word inflation more than we had in the past 20. So I think owners have seen this across the board. We're probably some of the last who have raised prices, at least in my experience and talking with other PMs. So owners right now are seeing it in other areas. It's still not fun. goes back to the empathy. If you can have data, I think if you've been managing for a few years, it's easier because you can remember, I know water heater at Home Depot was $498 for a 50 gallon. And now that same water here is $700. It's a very easy data point. That's tough to replicate. That comes with contacts. It comes with reps with doing this. And a third-party pricing book might be helpful with that, but I think layering in those informations to explain to owners the why behind it and third-party vendors, I think even asking questions to them could be really helpful. Definitely challenging. It's not fun whenever you have to raise your prices, but the reality is there are rising costs everywhere all across the board, which does make it a little bit easier here. I know in the past, we've also, when we had some um, 
price increases, we've also sent out letters to people who it was going to impact. So if we were in different markets, we were going to send out a letter of maybe a management. They were under a certain management agreement. We were sending out those letters. So just, again, this kind of gets back to communication as opposed to it just showing up on their statement and them going, then, then they're getting in a panic and reaching out to you. All right, I'm going to lob out the last question. We've got only a few minutes left. And I'm going to go around the horn here. And I'm going to ask the question, uh, what sets the best property managers apart from average property managers? Matt, we'll start with you. What sets the best from average? I would say that... I would say in a nutshell, like if you're consistently iterating on your processes and you're consistently raising the bar, that is going to naturally set you apart from the average property manager who is um, probably just running their business kind of status quo. So that continuous iteration, looking at your people, looking at your processes, it's one of our core values is, is to grow. And I would say that's going to, at the end of the day, over a long period of time, probably from my perspective, be the biggest separator. That's great. And you can answer this either way, like individually, like the individual property manager or as a company. So yeah. Kara, why don't you go next? Sure, sure. I think it's a, a culmination of things. And I'll tell another very quick story. Um, when I was in my prior life, I once ran across a really large problem that escalated all the way up to the COO of our company. And when we went to solve what this problem was, there were three different people involved. There was myself, the COO, and another team member. And the question came down to what broke the system. And to one person, to the CEO, it was that the process was not being followed. To the next person, it was that the residents and the team members weren't being trained. And to me, it had everything to do with the team who was executing it. And so the answer in, in a whole is that you have to be good at a lot of different things to be a great property manager. Execution and ownership, though, probably being the largest of them. When I'm looking for a new team member to roll out or to support my team, I need somebody who's willing to take action. And I need somebody who's willing to be accountable for the action that they take, even if it's the wrong decision. It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to not know all of the answers. What's not okay is to stand still in an environment that requires action. So finding somebody who can fill those buckets is really important. And being able to see that the process is not solely what causes a great PM to be a great PM, that the team itself can't be what creates a great PM and that the tenant management is not necessarily going to be what sets somebody up for success. It's all of those things. Were you going to ask me, Matthew, my, my answer to that question? You never managed a property. So. I've got the answer though. Let me tell you what makes the best property manager is one who can fulfill everything that the salespeople promise. <laughs> that is the best property manager. That's all you have to do. Yeah. It's really low bar, right? That's what you're saying. Right. Super low yeah, bar. Yeah. Do you do this? Yes, we do. Will you drive out to my house on a daily basis and do a walk? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you'll that. sign this management agreement, we'll do it. <laughs> Go ahead, Gray. You want to round us up? Yeah. I think like from a property manager standpoint, this is a business with a lot of challenges. It's gritty. It's hard. We sit in the middle of a lot of problems. So probably like grit and willingness, like the ability to deliver hard information, because this business is just hard information after hard conversation. And can you deliver that to the owner with empathy, but also you're not afraid to pick up the phone and can you be firm and communicate that. And so do you have grit and are you able to, or are you afraid to run into the fire, afraid to call that owner and uh, deliver this kind of bad news? Because this business will wear you down. It's really challenging. And so that is what I've seen from PMs that come in and they're excellent and their owners love them is they'll deal it to them. It's real, but they're not afraid to get on the phone or send that email and you know, tackle these problems head on. Because that's what we're hired to do. We are hired to solve problems for owners because they have other things that they want to do. So our business is predicated on problems. And so you got to be okay with that. And you've got to know that. <clears throat> You nailed it, Gray. It, it is a business of problems and a business of problem solving. If there wasn't a problem, then there wouldn't be a, a business. So yeah. I guess we need to be thankful for all the problems. I want to thank the three of you for joining us. I think this was super awesome. I, the sad thing is I feel like we just scratched the surface. And I know a lot of people, we still have some questions that people have asked, but 
we promised to wrap it up by 4.30 Central. And so that's what we're going to do. Um, 